Good morning, good day, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you to people watching in live and to those who are watching the replay of this. I am joined this evening, where I am, by Nick Kettles, uh, a man who uh, I, I first learned about by reading some articles he'd written a number of years ago, and then discovered this extraordinary uh, mission he's been on, and the life change he went through. A lot of people's careers are very linear. Nick's has been anything but that. And it was so confusing to me in a way to try to encapsulate what it is he does, I thought I'd make it even more challenging for the man himself. So Nick, before we do a proper welcome, in a haiku, what is it that you do? What is it that I do? Uh, people want to uh, see, see the world with new eyes and ears. Paradox resolved. <laughs> I think that's what I wrote, isn't it? Yeah, something like that's fantastic. <laughs> I think you, you, you probably had to Google the haiku, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. I didn't know it was five syllables, seven syllables, five yeah. syllables, but now I do. And that was my shot. <laughs> uh, a lot of writing exercises at school about uh, brevity taught through that. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, so uh, I, I've been baffled since uh, we, we first agreed to do this podcast about how to introduce you. But initially, you were a crusading journalist. You were writing for some mainstream publications, very well-known ones, um, and a bit more financial-type writing. But you were trying as, as almost guerrilla writing to sneak in the environmental issues on the side of those. That's correct, yeah. And... It was while researching one issue that I I found some of your writing and it actually completely disillusioned me, disheartened me. Like so many in the world of conservation, I had a, a daydream of one day being some eco awards at the after party. There I am with Greta Thunberg in the bathroom, snorting lines of cocaine. <laughs> harmless, harmless, innocent little daydream. You tell me that's unlikely to happen, or at least your writing did, and, and why is that? Uh, it's a good question. Well, I, 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 I hope that Greta would not be doing that, <laughs> and you. <laughs> With a 45-year-old guy. <laughs> yeah, for your own health, but I, I get your, your, your point. Because uh, when I was working as a, a campaign journalist for The Ecologist magazine, I was commissioned to write a piece on the relationship between cocaine use, which is predominantly middle class because it's expensive, although I believe that's changed now, you know, it's cheaper. Um, and uh, the destruction of the rainforest. And, and it was interesting to discover that, you know, a gram, you know, or I think it's a line, a line or a gram, I forget which one it is. Uh, it, it takes about a square meter of rainforest in order to grow enough coca which is the plant from which cocaine comes from in order to uh, make that line and in fact coca doesn't grow i mean it grows naturally but it doesn't grow uh, in you know in industrial levels naturally and so they have to slash and burn the rainforest pristine rainforest and the rich biodiversity there to make space for it and often that that is funded by uh, organizations previously like farc uh, which is the uh, Revolutionary Army of Colombia, um, which uh, and the coca funds them, uh, and or you know drug drug mafia um, from South America, and uh, so then that indeed the production not just rips up the rainforest but leads to a lot of suffering for people who actually make it, um, and so our innocuous or innocent use, you know, and uh, you know I I did experiment with uh, cocaine in the the late eighties, so you know I, I'm not pointing any fingers, you know, I've had my experimental drug use as well, has a consequence. It's not just on my own health or the person I'm buying it up from in, in the, the UK or wherever it might be has a direct link it's, it's to the, the rainforest. I, mean, yeah. I know so many people, I know a lot of people who would uh, turn a blind eye to the human cost and, and we've all seen enough action films to know that these are the bad guys. There aren't good yeah this is not a convenient risk of being shut down producing coca in the rainforest they're bad guys um that human cost they can turn a blind eye to but if you were to say to them and i think it was a, a line is a square meter and a gram is a hectare of rainforest 100 meters by 100 meters um 
And that is, as you said, habitat loss to so many wild species. If you point out that, I was going to go, oh, you're kidding me. And that'll be the thing that would suggest to them, perhaps they can't do this anymore. It's, it's, um, and it's just the, the different triggers for different people. And it was an extraordinary article. I urge people to look it up, search Nick Kettles and narcotics were great. <laughs> the legacy you're leaving. Um, it's, it's called, uh, um, uh, how much rain? How much rainforest does it? Uh, uh, well, I forget the title in, in, entirely. But we we I was originally uh, inspired to write it because there was a award ceremony where two high profile celebrities had a public kind of they were both drunk, but they had a public battle with each other, uh, an argument on stage in, before of making an award where they said essentially. <clears throat> One of them said, I could snort you under the table. So I thought uh, to myself, yeah. how, much, how much rainforest, knowing this statistic that I'd, I'd quoted you, I, I thought to myself, how much rainforest does it take for one A-list celebrity to snort another A-list celebrity under the table, assuming they have far more money than, uh, than the average user? And I, I, I speculated, what is it? Is it a tennis court's worth? Is it a, uh, a, you know, right. a back garden of a terraced house? Is it a football field's worth? And I thought it was a really interested image. And I thought that image itself could provoke thinking, not just on the celebrity class, but actually the uh, um, the uh, middle class users who might otherwise, you know, be uh, supporting environmental issues. And I think that was the interesting mm. thing as well, was to provoke thinking amongst people who might think that they're already on a noble crusade and their drug use has absolutely no connection to to the conservation issues that they, they they believe that they support you know yeah, yeah. i mean it could be good because not only is it if you consider that there are say there's that hectare to make the gram is there needs to be a road in and out of there and that wouldn't be naturally occurring and then what we know off the back of that in terms of uh, with things like illegal logging in rainforests from southeast asia africa south america south and central is that those roads then become the access points for poachers. So you have poachers getting deeper and deeper into what were very well protected areas. Yeah. Um, and then in Africa, we had the, the classic example of after illegal logging, these roads opening up, poachers went in, got bushmeat, bushmeat and brought out Ebola. Mm. So these that, that's that's not linked to the cocaine trade, so maybe it's a reach what it's I've just a, suggested. It's a similar thing. There's a cascade of consequences is what yeah. I would call it. You know, yeah, yeah I like that lovely term. And, and um, it's, uh, I mean, you can go down and ping, pinpoint any number of animals that are, you know, disrupted. But a, a particular one that is also interesting, which is another area of the drug trade that uh, gets uh, doesn't we don't necessarily make the connection is between the use of ecstasy, um, MDMA, but ecstasy uses sarsaparilla, which is an oil that comes from a tree in the Indonesian and Malaysian rainforest. And in the the logging of those trees to actually distill the sarsaparilla, which actually feeds the ecstasy trade, is huge. And of course, there's right. animals such as the orangutan mm. who, who are you know suffer from that directly. And you can pinpoint that as a, a a direct link between those two trades and you know the destruction of those that habitat. But um, you know, and this uh, is going to bitterly disappoint so many people. Everything they've got to learn here. Um, Maybe, I mean, there's, yeah. also, there's also links between the environmental degradation, social degradation of growing of um, opium poppies for heroin. But then I, I, this was not in your article, but what we know yeah. now is that the heroin trade coming via Vietnam is run by the exact same people that traffic rhino horns. Wow. And what they've just found happen? yet another commodity. You know, if, if heroin's down, then they can still push rhino horns. So it's the same people behind it. They're also behind human trafficking for the sex trade. So again, it's the bad guys. There isn't an innocent, it's not an innocent tipple. No, it's not. And I, I, I think we touched on this when we met earlier is for, for me, it's really just the difference between people who, you know, think in a more linear fashion and don't see a direct consequence or cascading of consequences. Mm. To, to their actions and those who are able to think systemically and see, as you say, you know, every every cause has actually multiple reactions within an ecosystem and and cascading consequences 
and you know my actions locally do impact you know global uh, uh, have global 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 consequences. So uh, I'm, I'm terrified what's story. going to happen if I if I ask you about the environmental effect of drinking coffee or alcohol. So I, I almost don't. I don't. To, I don't know the answer to those. I'm good. Good. And this one. <laughs> there you uh, go. Well, you don't need to understand German to know that that is actually not alcohol. <laughs> well, I'm drinking. Tea, I'm drinking tea, and you know the British. Uh, it's probably under a contract that the British signed. 170 years ago to pre which is like a 300 year contract to preserve the best tea in areas that they claimed for themselves from you know colonial expansion so you know um you could research any food stuff and find some kind of consequence that was not desirable oh, yeah. yeah um yeah. i've actually seen a lovely thing recently and, and it is perhaps part of a global shift which was in tea yards in i'm pretty sure it's sri lanka where they've had a big issue with elephants who move through the tea field and it's not even to eat the tea that's i think it's too rich in tannins for them yeah. Yeah. but because of the corridors that they make to grow the tea those are natural corridors for the elephants to use and they meet the tea pickers and and often kill them maim them yeah. and just with the tower network and mirrors they've now given an early warning system very low tech which is what it yeah. needs to be um and they just do a flashing symbol. The guy in the next tower says, right, everybody move over this way. The elephants get to pass through and the people Wonderful. move back. And the disruption is is minor enough that the people behind with the money don't care because yeah. it's far less disruptive than losing a worker. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think there's the opportunity where we do have agriculture in place for legitimate crops. Um, for want of a better word, that, that you can get smarter about how you interact with wildlife. Um, well, I think that's the key, isn't it? It's smarter. It's just like uh, you, the, the, it's usually we frame any problem with, you know, there's, there's two solutions, you know, and actually we just need to, to think a little bit more broadly to think about, as you say, you know, what does it take to actually uh, uh, um, consider a solution that actually serves many different outcomes. And I think that's the inspiration of the rewilding movement. Uh, you know, the evidence yeah. that's coming in is that I let nature do what it needs to do to, with as minimal intervention as possible. And actually I discover that everything does have a purpose. There's that wonderful film called Big Farm, Little Farm from Los Angeles, which is really inspirational where they do the same experiment, you know, to let nature retake to some extent the farm they're working on. And the guy gets to a point where he uh, he can't tolerate that the dingo is coming in and, and or the jackal is coming in and stealing the ducks. And then, you know, he thinks therefore the, the jackal doesn't, or dingo doesn't have any, it's not a dingo, it's a- Coyote. If it's, coyote. A, if it's Los Angeles, it's a coyote. It's in America, it's a coyote, thank you. The third one, the third dog. Um, the coyote can't have a purpose and so he shoots he shoots it and he feels a huge amount of remorse and then he steps back and think well i need to learn more and he sets up all these night vision cameras in and and he realizes how many animals are coming into the land at night and he is able to see what does the jackal do at night and the jackal goes in and starts to eat uh, put their paw down into the hole of the gopher that is eating the roots of their fruit trees right. and so he's like oh yeah, now, you know, when everything is working in harm, harmony, everything has a purpose. You know, there's a natural order, a natural balance that is restored. Whether that's possible for us to do that, I think it's going to take a shift, not just in policy, but actually consciousness as well, from how we think and feel about the, our relationship to nature. Well, I think that there's, there's a well-known example also from the US of the wolves that were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Yeah, Park. absolutely. Yeah, same. And yeah and how it changed the speed of the river, which is seems far-fetched and it basically involves elk feeding on saplings. They couldn't do it anymore because the wolves yeah. could ambush them too readily, yeah. allowed thicker trees by the river to slow down its flow in flood. Um, and I believe that that made insurance premiums downstream cheaper. Flood insurance yeah. was reduced because of wolves. Yep. But I, what's, I lesser known, what's yep. lesser known is that with the reintroduction of the wolves, there was a population boom in smaller carnivals, carnivores, wow. weasels, badgers, even birds of prey. Yeah. Because when it was when the coyote was the dominant yeah. predator, it was taking out all those little weasels and, and badgers. And it was 
dominating them and they were they've got smaller territories once the wolves came in they suppressed the population of coyotes which allow the smaller predators to bounce back to the numbers they should be at which helps controls your smaller pest species if you want to call them the rodents uh, well, all the, the way down to, to you know overpopulation of some of the the, the uh, some insects, insects as well. Everything starts yeah. to become balanced. It sounds like the wolf is an umbrella species. Therefore, you know, it's yeah, it, absolutely. It's, it, it, it's an umbrella effect for all the species below it. But every ecology, I, I think of as as being a, a house of cards, and it's a, as fragile as a house of cards. You might get away pulling out one or two here or there, but something you don't think is key will make it all collapse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're, we're straying a bit here. So you had crusading journalism. You read, you wrote several articles. As I said, you you were a little subversive in trying to get mm -hmm. ecological messages into financial publications to get the people That's reading that to understand the implications of of just financial transactions. You grew dissatisfied, or you? I'll, I'll let you explain. You didn't feel it was working, basically. Um, no, I, 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 I wanted to fulfill my ambition to be a journalist, first of all. And so the, you kind of got to start, sometimes you have a living to make, you got to start where you, you are. And I'd been trying to break into work, writing for the national newspapers in the UK for some time. Um, and I, you know, had tried many things and someone said, well, why don't you have a go at the money pages of the Guardian? And I was just like... <laughs> Sure, I, I'm not very good with money. How could I write about that? But so yeah. try, you know, you're creative. Try some different ideas. So I, I'd been part of a, a, a local co-op where we would we were buying whole food uh, collectively. So like three or four of us would get together and say, well, we want to buy in bulk, and we were making a lot of savings. And I think mm -hmm. it was uh, actually good. Uh, we could figure out how it was a more sustainable. Uh, form of uh, shopping because it reduced the number of trips we were making to the supermarket, etc. So I put that maths together and pitched the article and the editor said, this is great. We need something different. Can't all be about share, you know, share investment yeah. and something. And then I got a foothold in, in providing slightly, you know, quirkier takes on money. So, you know, I would do a piece on blood diamonds and then I did a piece on, as I said, uh, you know, subsidence in, in houses and how that might be uh, affected by increased rainfall, which might be directly linked to climate change. So, you know, people will read the money pages for their own personal interest, but then if they read that something that is affecting their own personal interest is a, has a direct knock-on effect to, to the environment or conservation issues, then, you know, it might make them think, you know, people are often driven by self-interest. So, you know, it was a good place to kind of get that message in. But once I'd established a reasonable portfolio in that area, I started to pitch other papers and, and journals and was successful in, in establishing a relationship with the ecologist magazine which was really kind of like the pinnacle of my journalism career is the opportunity to really do what i think journalists ultimately who go to journalism school like i did in the late 80s early 90s really wanted to do to be more of a crusader and 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 i had a chance to write for them over a, a period of about four or five years where i i had a good relationship with the editor and there was far more freedom uh, at the Ecologist magazine than there was at, say, The Guardian, who I had been writing for, who have yeah. far more to lose <laughs> financially and uh, probably bigger advertisers to appease. Um, and, I mean, they're out there. They're out to take cocaine. You, yeah, exactly. Well, I don't can't know. Can't broke that. No, I can't, I can't comment on that. But um, The Ecologist had had a, you know, a reputation at not pulling its punches. It did a huge piece on Monsanto in the late 90s, for example, and uh, Monsanto threatened to close the printing, you know, put so much pressure on the printing company that the printing company refused to re to to produce it. So they went to an alternative printing company and they still produced it. You know, they, they stood their ground. Right. So I just had a lot of freedom and it was just a really wonderful time to write on a range of issues from animal conservation, specifically about two species, the bears in Europe and and sharks in the Middle East. Uh, as well as a range of issues such as the relationship between cocaine use and, and destruction of rainforest, forest and natural habitat, and a range of a full range of other issues. And so it was just a wonderful opportunity to fulfill that ambition and also to to you know add my voice and my energy to a cause that meant a lot to me. So 
Where do you think that, your, that your passion for the environment stems from? Um, it's a good question. A number of things. I grew up in the countryside from about age five to 12, which I think were formative years in the, the south of England, um, uh, near to a beautiful river called the River Itchen, which is a chalk stream river. It's very popular for trout fishing, but it's very pristine and very well preserved. And I used to play in that river as a kid, and I just used to get lost in the fields and the the river banks and just really had a you know, very intuitive relationship with with nature with me and my friends and the river was just very special you know we'd have we'd see it change through the seasons you know there'd be bits of ice form on it and then the weed would be cut and then in the summer it was just when it was super hot even in the summer of 76 which was a drought in the uk you know we were just bathing in it every day and and then in the wood, woods as well and living next door to the river keeper and the the forester as well. It was more of an old, a slightly more old-fashioned way of was life. Was your mum I... Enid Blyton by any chance? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's sounding just like those great stories she wrote. <laughs> the well, inn, yeah, we, were, and... we were we were poor, and I think there were other ways that, that it, I would have liked it have, to have been. But nature was lovely. But at the same mm. time, I could see there were things that were incongruent, you know, like I, at the time there was the rabbits were dying from myxomatosis right. and, and we had a, a, a disease called Dutch elm disease that ran through the entire elm population of trees in the UK and there's barely any elm trees left. And I, I remember seeing those things as a kid and seeing, oh, this is interesting, you know, these, uh, these animals dying of disease and myxomatosis uh, as a disease would have been introduced by man in fact but in france mm -hmm. that's where it originated from and it was to eliminate the rabbits so i could see there was something strange intuitively compared with the other natural cycles i'd learned to witness and then i forgot about it all when we moved to the town and it was just like all about the city and then went to london and um uh i think at some point my natural instincts to be close to nature i, I couldn't live in the city any longer i needed to get out it was just too much claustrophobia i wanted those open spaces again so i reconnected with that uh on some travels to to mexico in fact uh, on, okay. on the beach and, and connecting with the the pacific ocean and then also in in yosemite and uh arches national park in utah i think it was the first time i really connected with nature in a way i had as a child so there was just a natural love for for the beauty and scale of nature um, and then I think Utah, in the early I, 90s, what's that? I, I went to Utah for the first time about two years ago, yeah. and I was staggered at how beautiful it is. And you see, Salt Lake City is not a beautiful city, but you, you're it's a not. smidge outside of it. Yeah, and it's some of the most gorgeous things I've seen anywhere in the world. And the color, the color of the yeah. stone, and, and the, the these huge columns of stone, and and the sunset, and the, I, I'd say the aliveness of the earth, for want of a better word. Uh, it was just spectacular. I think it reconnected me to my love of nature. And I, I remember he, having a few educational moments in that tour where people would say, oh, you know, here's a cigarette. This was in 1989, in fact. Here's a cigarette, but this is this one is, uh, I think they were saying it was 15 years old. They, they had actually started right. to kind of document, you know, wow. how long things took to biodegrade. And something was going in. These were early kind of environmental sustainability messages. And something started to go in and early 90s um a girl from the mine was very passionate about conservation and sustainability and that sparked the interest again and i think i was very keenly aware of greenpeace at the time mm -hmm. as well and one of my first jobs out of university after qualifying as a journalist and having failed to get a job as a journalist because it's not the easiest is i got a job as a uh, a fundraiser a, it was a professional fundraiser mm -hmm. for an organization that used to follow up on uh, make phone calls to people who had agreed to be phoned. They were already donors. It wasn't cold calling. And they worked for a full range of organizations, and one of them was Greenpeace. And I remember the Greenpeace, um, one of the directors came in, and she was just like a fierce eco-warrior, and she gave us fundraisers a lecture. And I remember being electrified by the vision and the message of it and 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 then i was on the phone doing running this campaign it only lasted about three weeks and we were going through thousands of contacts of people who had said mm. they were willing to be contacted and I, I just was on fire i think i helped the i think i raised about one hundred and twenty thousand pounds in commitments and, wow. and there was 
something wow. about her, the director, right. who, who kind of ignited my vision. There was something about her certainty and then also her, I think, impatience as well. But even in 1993, which is when it was, she was like, time's running out. You know, yeah. interesting. We're still saying the, the same environment. Time. I mean, the modern environmental movement goes yeah. back to uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, is where a lot of, of people. Course, yeah. And so yeah. that was in the 60s. So, yeah. yes, by 93, it, it, yeah. it was definitely worth being impatient, as we all should be now. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah. And I mean, and I think that ignited me. And then I was looking for a way always to, you know, find a way to contribute beyond my and, and to use the skills that I'd learned and committed to and journalism, you know, your 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 pen is your your sword, you know, that's the expression. And yeah. and I was always looking for an opportunity to do that. Uh, uh, you know, amidst the responsibility of having to, you know, look after myself and provide, make my own living, you know. And but so it it wasn't satisfying to you, and you you found uh, a new way of life, and perhaps even a, you could say this is a new way of of sort of guerrilla style way, G U E, G no, rather than G O R, yeah. of introducing not necessarily even ecological thought, but just different ways of thinking. Um, so what is it that you do now? And you don't have to put in a haiku this time. That was very unkind of me. I think we said in our original meeting, one of the uh, aha moments I had was that uh, while I loved the campaign journalism, I, I started to realize that we were pissing off quite a few people, to put it frankly, because our style was effectively you're wrong and this is why we're right yeah. <laughs> and, you know if you're preaching to the choir they love it you know yeah. they love the richness of detail that you're offering you know the research that you've done maybe the angle is creative and they they will take that information as their own weapons to persuade others so you know we're arming the choir that we're preaching to and i i i, I just started to think well i wonder if there's a different way to communicate and two things influenced me in that first one was when I had to meet a senior politician for Colum from Colombia for this particular article about the rainforest mm -hmm. and cocaine. And he was very pro communicating the impact of cocaine use uh, by middle class users in the West on the rainforest mm -hmm. as a way of persuading Western governments to actually reconsider their uh, perception of, you know, Colombia's uh, political, internal political situation. And um, I was supposed to not like him very much because that's what my editor thought I would because he was very right wing and you know a friend of the Bush administration and um and I really did not agree with 90% of his policies where he was supporting yeah. the use of napalm for example on on being poured on the the crops um and yet on this one issue I totally agreed with him you know our use in the west was absolutely having a direct connection i wasn't going to allow him to use that issue as a mask and a smoke screen for the other things that was important yes. but on that one issue we could find common ground and uh, we had a very passionate conversation i really liked him i mean i thought well this that I, I felt that he was sincere so i couldn't i could I, I couldn't make him out to be like the devil you know what i mean it's like yep. the people you don't like they have children <clears throat> too you know they're not <laughs> like baby murderers you know and i i, I thought you know, I'm supposed to hate them and I can't. And I mean, maybe I lack the killer instinct as a journalist. That may have been part of it. But um, I started to think, you know, is there a different way in which we can communicate that actually brings people more into dialogue? And then the second uh, moment that I had that I told you about in our earlier conversation was meeting James Thornton, who's the CEO of uh, uh, Client Earth, in another article I was researching, who's a mm -hmm. lawyer who can't, whose client is the Earth. That's the name, Client Earth. So they That's will bring legal cases against, you know, against the government, against the EU, against big institutions to um, test the law, the limits of the law in terms of environmental protection and conservation. So we're back to pissing people off again here, but in a good way. Well, <laughs> yes, indeed. But what I thought was, well, you know, he's, I thought, well, these, this is just a bunch of aggressive lawyers. Great. We've got to use the law. But when I met him, he was extremely peaceful and very respectful and told me that he'd been a, a, a practitioner of, of zen buddhism for a long time and i said so how do you deal with the fact that you're sat across the table as a lawyer prosecuting effectively 
other people. Mm -hmm. He said, I just have to start from the place the other person is a human being and deserves my respect and the dignity that I would want them to offer me. And I, I realized, oh, I, you know, my heart was at war, if you like, yeah. and I had noticed that. And, and that sparked my interest in the, the value of nonviolent communication and, and, and how if we change the way we look at other people and we listen to them, then that can change the dialogue that we have with them. And that's been a journey I've been on for about the last 13 years. And I currently work as a, a, a trainer of uh, leadership development and coaching skills for, for business leaders, uh, because there are a body of coaching skills and leadership philosophies and mindsets that are based on exactly what I'm saying, that are rooted in a, a rich, uh, uh, rooted in emotional and social intelligence in a way that equips leaders to think and act differently because a lot of the ways corporations run in the world is based on very I would say narrow thinking that is disconnected from the feeling and heart center in a way that actually is not productive you know um, so that's my job now is to train people who want to adopt a different style of leadership. The good news is, while it's not universal, there are a lot of Fortune 100 companies that recognize they have to change the way they think and organize their companies if they want to survive. You know, their model, which is short term and sees human capital as a, as a resource to get something done, you know, an object to get something done, um, is not sustainable. Um, and they realize they, they have a short shelf life if they keep living the way they do. So. Is that something where a, a CEO, for example, knows that year-end results, he, he either gets a, a, a bigger crown or he gets a boot in the backside? And so they, they've got an even shorter cycle than a politician, for example, who's typically got four or five years. Yeah. Uh, a couple of, and that can yeah. lead to really short-term thinking. It's a couple of factors that, that it, it is in part that, uh, but it's there's two other factors that I think are really uh, telling on a lot of organizations. Human resource research, you know, HR directors mm -hmm. really understand today that, you know, the impact of this very top down hierarchical command and control organizational structure ultimately leads to burnout uh, and disengagement of employees. So, you know, they're may sound cynical but they've done their math you know they can figure out well actually the cost of actually layoffs and increased turnover of staff and then sick days etc through you know the fact that you know, a lack of work-life balance and a lack of engagement proper human engagement is actually more expensive than actually considering a different way so that's the first thing um, and they recognize that when people are engaged fully as a whole human being as opposed to just a role you know, an instrument to get something done. People want to invest more and actually they feel more engaged and more energized therefore. So that's one thing. And the second thing is this, uh, this crazy acronym that comes out of the Navy SEALs that a lot of all businesses today are using for at least for the last 12 to 15 years, but definitely in the last five years. And it's a VUCA, which stands for, it's a Navy SEALs use it as a, um, an acronym for highly charged situations. So VUCA stands for volatility, high volatility, high uncertainty, high complexity, and high ambiguity. So each of these things has a different definition. Right. And businesses yeah. today are increasingly recognizing, oh, we're not in a war place like the Navy SEALs, but we are experiencing VUCA type situations that we cannot prepare for. That's the key. They recognize Ah, and, and they're things that are out of their control, such as, you know, a shift in the world economy or a disruptive technology being introduced that blindsides them, like Kodak, what happened with Kodak and yeah. digital, for example. And they realize, well, how do we prepare for that? And they've done their research and they know that the old style of leadership, you know, which is very authoritarian, autocratic, is not equipped or fit for purpose for those kind of situations. And the cool news is is the kind of leadership that is fit for purpose is one that has a where the leader themselves has a, a, a much more holistic worldview uh, they are able to think systemically and they have highly evolved and developed emotional intelligence which means that they are about partnership not patriarchy i think is the right way of saying right. it they, they are able to build human relationships 
to bring people together and also to resolve paradox and conflict. So that is the exciting news. I mean, the, they've used logic to make that assessment, but the good news is the solution is one that is actually more human and possibly leads to people opening up their way of relating both to others, but also to the earth and the world as a whole. So that's what inspires me. Peter. You've just described a baboon troop. And I say this, normally when Tell you say me, how, baboon, how is that like a baboon troop? troop? So a, a baboon troop has typically 50 to 100 members in it. Yeah. And there can be various levels of genetic and interpersonal relationship in that. Yeah. There is no way a single male could control a group that size. It's beyond the capacity. So there's, and I'm not saying that it is without conflict. There's always conflict within the troop, but it's minor conflict. You you might have a scenario. So you and I have a, a, a fight for dominance. You beat me. You're dominant over me. But what I discover is that you've also done it to the guy across the road. So I partner up with him. And as a coalition, you will behave submissively. When you see the two of us coming, you back off. You, you, you come slow to the ground. You suggest, why don't you have these ripe figs? Catch us individually and you take what you want from us. Um, then there's, it's not quite a, it's nowhere near being a caste system, but females will choose one of the stronger type males and groom him in exchange for his protection over her and the potential young they're going to have. Um, and for a long, long time, because the males are significantly larger, significantly stronger than the females, and they do the fighting and they gather a harem of females, which is quite a state of flux between them and other males, um it's well the males are dominant it's just the females who decide when they will go down to drink and where which real estate they tend to sleep in at night uh when they will set off in the morning but the males are dominant it's actually the females within the troop that are making all of the the daily life decisions the males just thump each other um and and yet it's a it's a cohesive society that works very well without having a single you know, hyper dominant male or female. Uh, whereas, whereas a lot of a lot of other animal species, mammalian species, do have a pyramid. It sounds like it's self regulating to some extent. Yeah. And, and to your to your point, the the vision, if you like, of the future organization is is flat, right? And not flat where we have some kind of sense of false consensus, where we dilute conviction, but actually flat based on um, each individual being willing to take full responsibility for their own growth, for their own actions, and also to act upon their initiative. Now, the roadmap from where we are now to, to that vision is is unclear but but the desire and aspiration is is very very high because the level of productivity and creativity that can be unleashed when you remove that hierarchical structure is 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 vast and there's been some great examples of companies that have spontaneously reached that level of self-organization to your point you know uh, that where there's no need to have one chief that says follow me and i offer to dictate and the orders cascade through the hierarchy of different organizational rankings um there's a different way to live and i think that that's exciting because it mirrors to some extent nature you know nature is self-regulating and that's where organizations are aspiring to move now whether they hope to use that for aspirational qualities that remains to be seen but my take on it is my job is to train human beings who have lives outside of organizations so I think mm -hmm. I draw the line at, at working for some companies. I, I, I want to know that they're sincere in their desire to take responsibility for their world, work, their place in the world, and the fact that they're a contributor over and beyond the uh, economy. Um, but ultimately, my job is, you know, I'm, I'm here to support individuals in seeing and hearing the world, hearing others differently, wherever they are. And I know, you know, every person I a train inside an organization possibly has a partner possibly has children they're a mother they're a daughter they're a sister they're a community leader and so hopefully there's a cascade effect of of thinking and seeing the world differently through the the work that i do so if you were to be approached by a, a conservation organization 
And I mean, you've obviously, you have dealt with them in the past through your writing and, and as you said, fundraising. Is there something you see with conservationists or, or just straight ecologists where you think, guys, this is, is guys, girls, for people uh, put it, this is an easy fix or is it not that simple? I'm not approached by the conservation groups at this point. <laughs> like I've got no money. <laughs> got no it's money not, it's um, not about that. I, I just think that um, I think there's great people doing work in that area yeah. as environmental consultants. Um, I think in some respects I'm going, uh, taking this message, if you like, or this this way of thinking or this this relationship technology, if you like, into a place where consciousness itself is at its densest inside organizations that may still be very disconnected from their role in the wider world and my job is part of helping them to to wake up effectively and that um i'm not alone in that there's there's a whole army of people who work in my industry which is professional and personal development specifically skewed towards professional development who are motivated by a simple idea which is to bring humanity back into the corporation and i think that i you know that that isn't that, that that's a job that needs to be done i think there's other people who are doing work with conservation and campaign groups which is you know really important and then and there's other people better than doing that so, it's, um, I, I don't know about that they're better than you or not but it, it it fascinates me in the world of conservation that it, it seems quite often that the the biggest landmine is not legislation. The biggest landmine is is not coming up against a corporation that wants the same land or resources that you want to protect. It's often themselves. There, there's there's so much passion in conservation that it's it's like a lot of faith groups that you see where they 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 can't wait you know, to fight each other before they get to a mutual enemy. Uh, it's it's really extraordinary and in. Very frustrating. I also think it's why it's so underrepresented when it comes to lobbying of government. It's because they can never agree, well, this is the person that can go and speak for us. Well, you know, the interesting, I try and come up with a metaphor for that, but that's exactly what I started to see in the environmental movement back in about 2008, 9, and 10, when I was starting, this thinking was starting to bed in when I met this politician from Columbia and the CEO of Client Earth is that I thought, you know, we, we can't see the log in our own eye, you know? <laughs> we see the right. speck in yeah. the, uh, other people's eyes, but we can't see that to some extent we, we are trying to persuade them to change the way they act and uh, adhere to our policy ideas with the same kind of thinking and communication style that these corporations use to persuade consumers to buy their crap, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. a bit like saying to a corporation, you need to upgrade to Windows 10 from Windows 98, but we're using Windows 98 to tell you to communicate that message. Sure. Yeah, we exactly. We can't, can't, yeah. can't see the limitations of our own thinking and communication and relationship style. And, um, and it all, I think, frankly, comes down to emotional and social intelligence, for want of a better word. Everyone has an obligation to, to develop uh, that skill set, which sadly is lacking in the, the school place. Although increasingly I see some areas of hope. You know, you see in some, uh, I think, many primary schools in the UK, they have, you know, silent moments, you know, sitting, teaching mindfulness to t children teaching them to pause before they think. Even little simple things like this can be a huge, create a huge paradigm shift, shift in the way we relate to self and also to my, others. My daughter started school in the, the UK just a few months ago. And the other day that yeah. she just out of the blue said, oh, when at school, when we were doing yoga, I mean, you're doing yoga at school? I mean, I'm 100% I'm, I'm for it, but I just had no idea they were doing it. That's fantastic. I, I got rugby. I at four years old, they had me playing rugby. Yeah, I'm the most uncoordinated person in the world. That was never going to end well. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I love that happening for your daughter. It's it's wonderful. And I, that's, in the, you know, um, one of the root causes of our problems in the world is our education system, which, and this is maybe something to follow up on, is uh, the, sadly the, the late Ken Robinson, who died in September, who was such a, a champion for changing the way we design, um, 
uh, design education and, and prioritize certain ways of thinking and expressing ourselves and creativity, for example, instead of the current way, which, although it's changing, is still kind of, um, it's built in the image of the Victorian Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. It's like a production line. It's a sausage yeah. machine. We have identified a certain kind of... Uh, two times two is four, two times three is six, two times, yeah, and then you that's what you need yeah. to, to punch a well, machine in a factory. Quite, or in this case today, actually sit perhaps at a call centre and operate, you know, multiple screens of different dashboards and and we privileged and prioritize those and we go about measuring and training those things and measuring them much like we you would a production line or business uses you know kpis key performance indicators in order to yeah. measure success and 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 it it really objectifies the human potential and actually is a limited view of human the development of human potential it really is and if we change the education system then we'd change the people who came out of it and they would change change the world they really would um they would I, redesign organizations we should be training little kids how to redesign organizations and how to code and create new systems rather than you know drilling them down very narrow channels of thinking well, yeah um, teach them critical it. thinking and i understand the resistance Indeed, yeah, 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 in yeah, parts yeah. of the world um they don't yeah. want kids to grow up and question. They want them to be, no, no. you know, two times two equals four all the bloody time. Yeah. Um, they want them to have the right answer, right? Yeah. But who decides so, what the right answer is? Off the back of this, our regular guest, mm -hmm. Wayne from Indiana has written in. Oh, hi, Wayne. He said, he's not sure what mindfulness is, but it sounds foreign. Why should he listen to you? That's a interesting question yes yeah. well my, mindfulness is uh, uh, a um, a term that has been given to um, a way of becoming an observer of yourself right so i'm talking to you peter right now and i can be mindful of myself meaning i can observe myself while i'm doing it why is that a good thing because it means i'm going to be more thoughtful in the way that I think and act towards others. So I'm more likely to um, uh, observe the impact of my actions and I'm more likely to observe the thoughts that precede the actions. So mindfulness practice itself is designed to develop that muscle, which is like anything that we do as a human being, you know, whether it's learning to add two and two, as you said, or write mm -hmm. a poem or anything they're all just muscles that we use our mind for so mindfulness the act of observing ourselves as we speak and act is just another muscle and i think this research shows that it's good for your mental health it's good for your physical health and it's good for your interpersonal relationships so it's uh i was going to say thinking before you speak yeah. huh? uh, thinking before you speak must save a lot of marriages if it's applied um yeah, so just going back a step here, um, well, now that we've answered Wayne, I mean, do you, sorry, just I'll, I'll come back to him for a second there. Do you find a lot of resistance? If you get brought in by a company, who typically brings you in? Is it the CEO? Is it HR? It's a great question. Um, in the ideal scenario, it is the CEO, and here's why. Because if the CEO is heavily invested mm -hmm. in a transformation in way the company uh, thinks and acts, meaning to establish a new culture of how people relate and communicate with each other, the likelihood is it's going to happen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, and, and, um, and, and here's why is so you might say behavior tends to cascade down by example, rather than cascade up. And other organizations have, yeah, you know, they've identified, say, the value of a coaching culture, which is what it's sometimes called. Um, and they brought in a, a company like the ones that I work for, there are others, and they've trained like several thousand managers in the middle of the organization. Now, what happens is that they start to influence all the people below them, they start to relate to them differently, but then they try to get stuff done by, you know, report to the people they report upwards to who've not been trained, <laughs> end up with a roadblock. So, you know, we're willing to go in at wh whoever brings us in, whether it's HR and learning development, that is what mm -hmm. they're called, who want us to just work in the middle, because who knows what will happen. But in an ideal world, 
it's where it's from the CEO and the, the executive suite down. If they're invested in it, then it gets really exciting because they're often changing the vision of the company and they've done the math about how much money is in going to need to be invested. So it's not just a superficial or cosmetic exercise, which you know is a shame when that happens. But you know, so does that answer your question, Peter? Yeah, it, it does because I, I think uh, it's CEOs obviously have a reputation for being psychopaths and people think psychopaths yeah. always have a, a bloody kitchen knife in their hand mm -hmm. whereas in fact it's it's not the case they're just people who completely lack empathy and i've worked for some of those and you yeah. once you've read the articles about it you go oh yeah yeah that's I, i'm currently employed by that person very fortunate right now i work for a highly empathetic mm -hmm. uh, direct person i report in my day job the ceo of the company i work for phoned me to commiserate when when our dog died you know that's the kind of place i work in now that's a wonderful experience and that's how it yeah. should, should be i've seen a, a range of ceos a, a side career i had when i was trying to make it as a journalist was as a pr consultant and i met a lot of ceos who I was helping train them to go onto tv giving them like media training and and there were a range from what i would call the toxic who just you know mm -hmm. were like bulldozers and you know lack no empathy and then others who really genuinely cared no, it's not like they were environmentalists or anything like that. They didn't have some broad, all-encompassing vision for the world, but they genuinely cared about the livelihood of all their employees. And they knew that when they went on TV, if they screwed up, and that it could affect the stock price, and that might affect the number of people they could employ. <laughs> Elon and, Musk? Yeah, well, quite. <laughs> and they met enough CEOs who actually cared. And, and were aware of their responsibility to really see them with a new respect. But to your point, that's not all of them. Um, and you know, that's so, why I said without, from the top down, if we could just train the CEOs, I think we could change the world. <laughs> so without naming an organization or individual, do you have any story where a company's turn and more towards sustainability in, in which is a very broad word, obviously, um do you have a story about that um there's a story if, if you can't do it without giving away with the company it is i'd understand that you've got i'm sure pretty strong non-disclosure agreements um i'd say there's some that are kind of uh halfway there is the right way to say it no. is that they, they they have the vision and desire in order to um make that transition but they sometimes lack the courage to accelerate the process um and and that is again why it requires a ceo often to um you know have some kind of epiphany to you know offer the vision for the company and be have the will and the courage and conviction to drive it through there was an example from an article i wrote for the ecologist uh, which was about um psychological and physical obsolescence and how designers had a responsibility to challenge that thinking and there was one company i forgot what they're called but they were a carpet company they were huge the 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 ceo actually had had an epiphany and he was on the record of you know saying i've had almost like a shamanic awakening and i've had a vision of the earth as a living being and and he had developed this 15 year plan called mountain sustainability. And I think they're probably there now. In fact, it was from about 2007 through to 2020. And it was to create every part of the, all the materials they would use to make the carpets would come from sustainable sources. They would create a closed loop cradle to cradle design process where it was the company's responsibility to reclaim the, the carpet and recycle it. It was just right. inspirational. Um, companies I currently work for, um, some of them are in the technology space. So, you know, they, you would say their impact is more about, you know, server farms and how can they do their part there. Um, and then in the healthcare industry as well, where they recognize that the old model of medicine uh, is not sustainable because medicine will ultimately, old forms of uh, drug-based medicine needs to meet the data revolution that's happening where personalized information that comes from my well this is an analog watch but let's say it's a Fitbit <laughs> um, that 
that data can be used to create personalized medicine and 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 that and preventative therefore rather than cure based yeah preventative medicine and so there's a i think some exciting uh in developments that where they may not directly be about um the earth itself right or the planet it is certainly about creating a more humane society and um so sorry i can't say more no that's all right i mean i think ultimately though that kind of thinking does lead to sustainability if you want to create healthier mental environments for your staff you don't put them in a closed off brick room no first of all no. you give them a window and then make sure there's something to look at outside that window and ideally yeah. Yeah. it's it's not a, a smokestack belching out so um i mean I've, I've been fortunate to have one of the greatest workplaces in the world where i, I lived in a tent but i looked out yeah, yeah. to go delta <laughs> and, and I, I still think probably some of the happiest days of my life mm -hmm. um and yeah that's it was never embarrassing because there was nobody to invite back <laughs> but um uh yeah I, I think that was a great working environment put in place largely just by the job I was doing as a safari guide. But I'm very aware now how important that is in a workplace to have that. Um, and it does require a nice environment outside that window. Mm -hmm. It is uh, beautiful. It, it, even little things like that can just, just change uh, our workplace environment and lead to better decision making and that's really what it is we may not think as we said to you wayne who wrote in simple mindfulness practice what how, how on earth does that affect well you know it starts with me doesn't it you know as i take care of myself and i i, I think differently and i am more mindful in the way i act and think then that affects my relationships to others and together we therefore possibly can make better decisions together we can see a broader vision of the earth together Etc. So I think it absolutely is a direct connection. This I think we have to get beyond seeing it as a war of attrition. You know where there are some people who are wrong and I'm right, and I have to bring them over to my side. There's a different way to look at the world. I think it'd be very interesting to have you moderate a discussion between trophy hunters and those opposed to trophy hunting. Um, because that I'm not sure I'd be best positioned for that, having written about conservation. Right? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not you. saying that, that that we should compromise against those things yeah. at all. I think that, that there's no place for trophy hunting. Period. That's it. It's not about not having conviction. It's not about being lily livered about this. It's just about that as we talked about one of the best ways to piss someone off is to just tell them wrong and and shame them in public and it's going to make them more likely to defend themselves mm -hmm. and say well now i'm going to do it more right yeah you know and they do it almost to give you the middle finger the and japanese that's what with whaling what's that the, the japanese are doing that with whaling until yeah, the fifth is like, taken from their face they're going to keep whaling yeah exactly and I, I that that's the point i don't think it's about compromise in this respect there are some things that i think are beyond compromise and trophy hum hunting is absolutely one of them you know um prioritization is a key thing given you know time is of the essence you know where do we prioritize our resources collectively to bring forward that argument but again um uh, this is not about uh, compromise is just a different way of communicating because ultimately if we do reach this is an argument I put forward in one of my last articles for the ecologist which was um, I posed the question I said even if we do solve the world's energy problems right and say we're running on solar and a combination mm -hmm. of wind for example I said if we don't sort out who we our relationship to ourselves and how we relate to others well we're just going to find another way to squabble about who owns the sun's rays and who <laughs> owns the world's water so we just transpose the arguments we're having about oil onto water and sun. And, well, that's and the I second said, well, time you've depressed me tonight, Nick. Thanks. Sorry. Well, then that's, why I, <laughs> that's why I quit as a, as a campaign journalist, because I thought, well, actually, the real work is preparing people to be in a different kind of relationship with each other. Because even if we solve the world's problems, we're still going to have to get on with each other. Right. And yeah. and yeah. so and I and actually, I don't think we're going to. That's it. It's a systemic shift that needs to happen where actually in order for the shift to happen, consciousness has to change. And that starts with the individual in how they see themselves and they see others and therefore 
their relationship to the earth because the earth is the ultimate other you know so it's like i have a relationship with her and i think if we we we, we people are willing to open up they will start to see that actually the earth is i can have a living experience with the earth as you described to me when you're talking about the savanna it's all very well to read in a book about um how everything that you hear has means one thing but it also means another thing but to experience it is a living experience and it's 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 awe inspiring it changes the way we want to you know you can't um love the earth truly unless you really start to get close to it and start to maybe get your hands dirty a little bit and 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 have an experience from it which will mean we'll have to detach ourselves from our screen addiction over time so that's that's why I love seeing people on safaris because there's there's no signal out there, and it's just the screen the screens become useless. Uh, people still take their phones on, on out on safari drives. Uh, they're they're actually useless as cameras with wildlife, but um, I had, yeah, they, they I can't had, get it out of their pocket. Yeah, I had a really interesting experience in the Pyrenees. Uh, my my daughters and I we go um, walking down a, what's called a canyon on the side of the mountain in the summer where you walk down the riverbed and you can jump down into the pools and so on or you might need to rappel down a waterfall but it's a very peaceful thing to do and you're often guided by someone that's very um knowledgeable about the flora and fauna of the area so it's a really wonderful moment to just switch off and i remember being part of a bigger group and there was a family there and you have to wear a helmet because it's you know there's a risk of falling on a rock and and it was a small family. They were really lovely, but they had a GoPro on the cam on the fan, and they spent the entire time going down, you know, half of this canyon, you know, posing for the GoPro, right? And I was yeah. just like, okay, that's their life. That's what they wanted to do. All fine, you know. And I'm, but they were missing a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw them actually just miss this beautiful, very rare newt that was swimming, for example. So they just oh, right. missed that. And then there was a moment where we're in this huge pool because some you're in a wetsuit, you have to swim sometimes. You're in this huge pool halfway down the mountain in this river, and they lost their GoPro. It came off the helmet, and they were diving for it. And then they got to a point where we don't have enough time for them to get it anymore. And then afterwards, it was as if they'd, someone had made them naked. You know, they were just suddenly very, very self-aware that they, uh, you know, that the screen was being used. You know, the camera or the screen was being used to distract themselves from having to be totally present with what was happening mm -hmm. it was a really yeah. interesting experience and i think that's where we are you know we need something to disrupt that kind of uh, a form of distraction that we create it, well i mean that's a whole other comment you know a fireman Maybe checking their text these days as they run into the building um yeah. but uh, i know that you've actually you've got to go and, and teach some people to be better people um, so you're going to wind up here, but we do insist before you go, uh, when I say we, it's me, basically. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I do insist some good news to sign off with. You want me to share some good news? Just some good news. Any good news. Doesn't matter what it's about. Just I always good news. Yeah, the good news is that since I, you know, trained several thousand people inside corporations, I can absolutely confirm that the vast majority of them are extraordinarily heart-centered people who care about each other and they really care about the planet. And and I think that uh, if we can get beyond demonizing the corporation, there's a hope that the corporation itself can play a role in the transformation of the world because while we're relying on governments, we might wait a lot longer. And it's like, so that's the good news is that the people I meet are, you know, they're not ignorant, they're not stupid, they're not mean. You know, they are really good people and they care about each other. And the majority I, I meet care deeply about the world and the crisis that we're in on all levels and want to make a difference. So that might be one that of the most hopeful messages I've heard. The, the idea of the corporations being the, the solution in the end and not to demonize them. That's wonderful. I would say give them a chance is what I would say. Yeah. And yeah. I would then say with those that, you know, show that they're not listening, hold them to account, because there's plenty of those still, mm -hmm. really. I'm not I'm not absolving all corporations. <laughs> so we, we, um, we're not offering an olive branch to Monsanto yet then? 
I think they got bought, didn't they, by one of those other big companies? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> it's not my world. Um, yeah. I know about lions that take over other territories. <laughs> That's where I live. No, um, I, think I, think, I know you've got to go. But thank you very, thank very much you. for your time this evening. Um, that was yeah, really, you. really interesting. I, I, I loved what we were talking about because it's so different to the, the world that I normally okay. inhabit. Um, and yet I do see traces of baboon in it. I look for, I'm going to, I'm going to go research that further. I like the analogy, but really thank you, Peter. I love what you're doing and more power to that and the growth of your, your podcast. I think, you know, these, these kind of conversations, they just hopefully stimulate other people's thinking. And, uh, um, as you said, invite a bit more critical thinking, uh, which yeah, is so, so miss, missing and always happy to, to help. So give me a shout if you, if you want to talk further. Love to have you back on. Thanks very much, Nick. And uh, I hope you have a great evening with your further training. Yeah, thanks so much. We'll speak Excellent. soon. Bye-bye.